Hello and welcome back to the inner. Today I have with me special guest Gina uh, Guerreri. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How Thank are you? you? Me? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, if you would um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So um, I am. I guess how I would define myself is on a spiritual journey in this life that has led me to, you know, amazing experiences, incredible human beings who have taught me so much. And um, that started when I was 19, so many, many years ago. And that has been my most, I think, the most pivotal thing in this life for me has been like my spiritual enthusiasm, like wanting to know more, what is beyond this body, what is beyond um, the, the regular life that we lead, you know, every single day. And it really started when I was super young and I was like, I think I was four or five and I was just like, what else is there? You know, there's me, I could, there's me, but like, what else is there? And then ever since then, I was just like searching, searching, searching. And I've, you know, with the grace of God met amazing teachers who've taught me, um, taught me things and allowing me to experience who I am and, and what else is there. That's great. So this is a bit unique for my show, but um, I reached out to you initially because I wanted to get in touch with Dr. Palai, and they told me that you were the next best thing. <laughs> so if you could um, kind of describe to the audience um, who Dr. Palai is and kind of what he does. Yeah, well, I don't think I'm the next best thing, but in terms of an interview, we are probably um, for... Uh, Dr. Pillai is um, a, a mystic, a scholar, an enlightened master. He has been, you know, at least in this lifetime, on the journey of bringing spiritual technology and spiritual teachings from his lineage in Tamil Nadu, southern India, to the West and to the whole world. And that is his greatest commitment. His mission in life is to end suffering and is to have us all realize that we are divine, that there is a, you know, that we are gods essentially, right? That there's a divinity within us that if executed can create an unimaginably amazing life free of suffering. Awesome. So if you could go a bit more in detail about your journey into where you started off, uh, uh, where you are now, how you filled in the gap between those two. Sure. Um, so my spiritual journey, like I said, kind of started when I was very young and, and realized and just just repeating, like I actually repeated the mantra, me, like me, me, like trying to find out what else was behind me. But I was just a little kid. And then um, I was Catholic. So I connected deeply with um, Christ. Mary, the saints. I loved going to church. I loved experiencing that silence when you just are looking at the altar or feeling connected to God. Um, and so as I grew in that process, I, I was like, oh, I think there's more to this though, because at that time, girls couldn't be altar people, right? Like, so there was limitations for, for women, for girls. And I was like, that doesn't seem right. Like, I want to be able to talk to God. I should be able to tell God, you know, my confessions versus having to go tell a man who's then going to tell him. Like, I felt like I had the right <laughs> to be 100% um, spiritually connected to God. And so I didn't dismiss anything that I learned um, from the spiritual perspective. I loved it all, but I knew there was a little bit more that would reach me, reach my spirit, would reach what I was searching for. And so when I got into college, I saw a sign that said, learn to meditate. And I was like, hmm, okay, let's try that. So I went to this meditation class and my whole world opened up. It was, you know, focusing on the different energy centers in the body. And I just all of a sudden had started having experiences. And I was like, wow, okay, there's a whole different element to being spiritually connected. Not only can I talk to God or, or, or have a conversation or a connection with this divinity, but now I can actually find it within myself. I actually have this, this, this energy that is um, something that is allowed to grow, that is um, clearing out maybe these misconceptions that I have and, and just having a you know, beautiful experience. So that was throughout college. And then I met my first spiritual teacher, Dr. Frederick Lenz. I studied with him for about seven, eight or so years, he passed on. 
And then I studied with a Tibetan Buddhist for a little while, um, Rinpoche, and then I uh, met Dr. Pillai. And once I met Dr. Pillai, I just immediately knew that was he was the real deal. <laughs> he was, you know, someone who's going to that I was deeply connected to immediately, and that who was going to, you know, essentially change my life. And that was um, in two thousand, so twenty three years ago. And since then, um, have been studying his teachings. Uh, then I was, you know, blessed to become one of his teachers to pass on his teachings to other people. And then I had this, you know, kind of deep prayer one day. I was living in Manhattan, walking up the in Upper West Side. And I just said to God, I'm like, look, I'm working, spending the time, giving the, spending the energy you gave me in this life to just make money to live. Like, what about my purpose? What about how I'm going to serve you? What about how I'm going to serve the world? Like, can you figure this out? Like, I need to do something different. I don't just want to. I don't want to spend the the life you gave me just to to live here without actually creating benefit. So, uh, two three months later, after that deep prayer, Doctor Pai called me on the phone, which he had never called me before, and was like, "Do you want to work for me? Do you want to um, come help? You know, create a retreat center?" And I was like, "Oh my gosh, okay." <laughs> so that opened up my whole um, new passage of life, which was. The answer to my prayer, which was I no longer had it to do work that was not aligned with my purpose. Right now, I was working for Dr. Pillai. Now I was, you know, helping to fulfill his mission. Now I was fulfilling, you know, feeling fulfilled in myself. And um, that was around I don't know, 17 years ago, 15, 17 years ago. And so since then, I've been extremely blessed to just do what I love all day in terms of. Um, working for his companies, his organizations, um, serving, you know, the people in his community, serving him. And um, which brings me to where I am now, which is here awesome. with you. <laughs> so there's a few things I'm going to have, I'm going to go back on. Um, you mentioned the energy centers in the body. Could you mm -hmm. give us a brief summary? I've heard a few things regarding the energy centers or chakras, which is more commonly known. Yeah. Um, how many are there? Because I've heard some say 114. Some say that there are seven main ones. Some I've yeah. heard nine, some 22. So in your area, um, how many is there that y'all work with? Yeah, so there are there are a lot. In fact, there's and, and I don't know the exact number because it's like you said, it's different from whichever study you're really going with. But there's there's the main chakra system in along the spine, right? And from there, the typical number is seven, but there are more in between, but like those larger kind of knots of energy that we that are more typically recognized, we would say that there are seven. Yes, there are more. There's like at, at, at least 13 or more, as Dr. Fly has mentioned. Um, and then, of course, if you get into like the energy centers and all the different meridians in the body, there's a lot. <laughs> um, but in terms of the main that we really focus on, there's this tube of light um, called the Shishimna, starting at the very base of your spine <laughs> and going up through the top of your head. And then along those, along that shashamna is these, these energy centers, these chakras. So you have your root chakra, and then in terms of, which is the very base of your spine, and then several uh, um, others, and then depends on which ones you want to focus on. So for example, we might go from the root chakra to the navel chakra around your belly button, and then you might go right into your heart center, your throat, your third eye, and your crown. There's other ones that like the sex chakra or, you know, that we don't focus on because we don't really need more of that energy, right? <laughs> That's innate to humans that, you know, we already have sexual energy. What we want to do is be focusing maybe on our willpower in, you know, the, the belly or the navel center or your heart center or the creative center of your throat or, you know, awakening some wisdom in your third eye. So, that's where um, you really select the different energy centers to focus on, depending upon what you want it to kind of promote within you. Awesome. Um, so also, how did um, I guess you I guess I could say um, what can you say about somewhat combining the meridians with the chakra system? Combining them? Um, well, they're from what I understand, it's all the same system, right? It's an energy. We all have energy. We have physical bodies. We have energy body bodies, right? And we have these, um, we have auric bodies that go around the outside of our physical body. Um, I'm not so sure about combining them, but 
to me, they're all one integrated system and you have different meditations that focus on, on different ones. So for example, you know, at Pillai Center, we also have a meditation that focuses on your, your, the centers, centers in your hands, right? And like doing a meditation where you're really feeling into that and feeling a, a mantra or, med, um, or a manifestation there. Okay. So pretty much it's the same system, just different focuses. Yes. And different levels of energy and different areas like the bottoms of your feet and the, in your palms or hand are very, um, um, kind of activated ener energetically. And you would know this, right? If you, if you just did this and kind of like focused uh, here, you start, everyone would start feeling it because it's just what we have from an, from an energy perspective. Yeah. So, um, what is Dr. Pillai's backstory? How did he become who we know him as today? <laughs> um, from what I know, uh, he started. He he was born in Rameshwaram, this small island off the the very end of, of India, and and a very simple life. You know, there's it's just I think fisher you know, fishery is the only thing that they really did there to and farming for for money. Um, and there was this temple there and as a young child, he would go to this temple and have like spiritual experiences. And he was a very young, you know, between five and seven. And then his mother noticed that he wasn't sleeping, right? Like he would just, he had this, um, he, he, at a very young age had an immense amount of consciousness where he didn't need to sleep. He would go and worship at this temple and meditate, you know, as a child, um, divine beings would come to him. And Rameshwaram, this little island, is known as a very, very pure place. The temple that's there, there's uh, a Hindu uh, story where Lord Rama had to go to that particular location in order to cleanse his sins for killing Ravana, who was a demon, right? So even though he killed a demon, he still sinned, he killed someone. So he had to go um, kind of cleanse himself, right? Do penance. And it was that island that he was sent to. So this island holds these purification, karma removal energies. And that's where Dr. Pillai was born. And he says that he needed to spend those 18 years of his life to purify himself even more so for his work in the world, to um, for his work in the world, for his mission, you know, for him to be able to move forward. Um, so that's where he started. And from there, he began studying with um, this one teacher in the Himalayas and taught him about the goddess energy, creative forces, um, Sinhas who in, in Tamil Nadu are perfected beings. They can manifest anything. There's different powers that can be uh, gained through certain meditations. And those people, uh, those Siddhas uh, did it 100%. Then he actually studied with, um, and of course he went to college along the way. Like, so he's kind of living this both life. He's going to his, uh, you know, he's going to college. He got his master's degree. He's also studying with these spiritual teachers and, and going deep into, into that. And then he studied with um, Maharishi, the, the TM teacher. Uh, what's okay. his full name? Maharishi Mahesh, uh, Mahesh, Mahesh Yogi. Ma Maharishi Mahesh, Mahesh Yogi. Um, uh, so he yeah. studied with him for quite some time. Um, alongside some other people like Deepak Chopra, or like all around the same period of time, um, and uh, and then he brought, then he came to the West. He came to the University of Pittsburgh, where he was a student. He got, um, uh, he came over as a student, and then finished his doctorate, his PhD, and then started teaching meditation. <laughs> he didn't go into, you know, teaching uh, in, in the colleges, but he did begin his teaching career as um, a spiritual teacher. And that was about 40, 50 years ago, something to that effect. And ever since then, he's been, uh, you know, a long time ago when YouTube first came out, he, the t Time magazine called him the YouTube guru because he was one of the first gurus on YouTube to be really teaching spiritual, um, spiritual teachings at the time. That was in, you know, about 20 years ago. So since then, we just continued to grow. He, another significant, um, I should say, a significant point in his life was when he, he connected with Wayne Dyer, Dr. Wayne Dyer. So Dr. Pillai gave Dr. Wayne Dyer the awe ah meditation. And if you're familiar with that, it's the awe ah meditation. You take the, 
your energy, like we talked about from the base of the spine, the sex energy, and bring it all the way up to the third eye and chant ah. And, and then as you're visualizing what you want to create, you're infusing it with the sound of ah. Dr. Pillai gave this meditation to Wayne Dyer. Wayne Dyer then started using it, loved it, and then wrote his whole book, Manifest Your Destiny, around um, this mantra and the creative force that that allows you to manifest, which is a sexual energy and, and your focus. Um, and then Dr. Wayne Dyer actually wrote in his final book, I can see clearly a whole chapter on Dr. Pillai. So if people want to see uh, Wayne Dyer's you know, kind of connection with Dr. Pillai, that's how. He also dedicated um, Manifest Your Destiny to Dr. Pillai, but his name at the time was called Guruji. So if you read that dedication, it says Sri Guruji, which is Dr. Pillai's name at the, at the time. That's awesome. I recently found out about Wayne Dyer uh, when I was studying the Tao Te Ching. I loved his translation of that book. Yeah, he's great. He's got so much good stuff. <laughs> yeah. So um, going back on a few of the things that you were talking about, um, what is karma? Okay. Karma is the, ca uh, the law of cause and effect. Uh, if you do something, then there would be a, a, a reciprocal, like an action that, that comes as a result of that. And so it depends on if you believe in multiple car, uh, lifetimes or if you're just feeling like this is our one shot deal, then, you know, karma can be within this life. You said, you know, you did something to someone and then it came back to you, right? Like, so that's so a lot of people, I think, is a general, generally agree that that could be, you know, could be a truth out there. Like do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? We want to make sure that as, as we act, that we know that there's consequences consequences to those actions may not hit you right now. It may not be something that immediately comes, although sometimes it does. Um, it could, it could manifest itself, you know, years later, it could manifest itself in another lifetime. If, if you know, if, if you believe in multiple lifetimes. So karma is that. And so when a lot of times when at Polite Center, when we talk about karma, we also talk about your current circumstances, right? Like, because that's a result of what you had done. Right. Like, so if you worked really hard and you got a really good job or you, you know, you're really working on this relationship and you're doing well with it. Like what you have is what you've created. What you have is what you've worked on. What you've had comes from the past. And that is your karma. Your karma is kind of your current circumstances based on what you did to create that. So we talk about karma in both ways. One is like kind of a kind of a, like a bad karma in a way that is like what's holding you back right now from what you want to create in the moment. So let's say you tried real hard and you you know tried to get this job, but didn't work out. And so then there's this maybe a karmic pattern of not feeling worthy enough in order to create it, right? So karma is, um, is that. It's the energy that basically has your life it's, a, it's the energy that has dict that has determined your current circumstances, in a sense, and whether that's from this lifetime or other lifetimes. And, you know, in the multiple lifetime perspective, it's always fun to, like, zoom out and be like, okay, so maybe this time around I had um, not having good relationships at all. But there's nothing in this life that I can map it to that says, like, why? But maybe in a prior lifetime, you were really bad at relationships, right? Like, or you swore off relationships. And now that energy, because our soul doesn't die, right? Like if we're reborn, that energy is coming in. You're still, you know, that you're still vibrating with certain thought forms that came for, or, or actions and reactions that came from a prior life. And you're living that out until that lesson is learned or until you've kind of satisfied that, um, that karma. Awesome. So you mentioned uh, Rama. Um, so what is the perspective that y'all hold concerning the deities in Hinduism? Um, are they individual gods or are they like people who access some level of divinity within themselves? Are they personified principles of creation? Uh, how do you define the many deities in uh, mm. that culture? Yeah, great question. So in Hinduism, there is a variety of gods and goddesses, right? And now in Christianity, we have one God. And in Hinduism, there's a lot. And so me coming from being Catholic and really just loving my one God, you know, loving my one God and speaking to God, when I got introduced to Hinduism, I was like, wait a minute, how does this work? So I, you know, never 
let go of the, the sense of that there was one universal principle holding all of the all of the energetic universal power, right? And from what I understand, Hinduism also holds that energy. And what happens is though they've created ways in which, uh, my perspective, I should say, uh, Hinduism has created ways in which for us to understand and relate to God's different aspects. So if God, our all knowing, all being one God, can be fierce, can be loving, can be productive, can give us abundance, can take things away from us, right? God can do all of those things. In Hinduism, they have individual archetypes that do that for it, for that that uh, symbolize and embody that. So, for example, Rama, we just mentioned, he's he's a warrior, right? And um, so he embodied certain energies that were. Um, courageous and triumphant and you know he didn't give up he was loyal all of those things then you have someone like Lakshmi the goddess who embodies abundance and purity and um, beauty uh, prosperity of all kinds right so there's just these these archetypes Dr. Pai calls them because they because they hold certain energetic imprints and then we when so and if you want to get to know or tap into that energy. It's a little easier to say like, oh, you know what I really want in my life is more abundance. Let me go, let me go learn all about Lakshmi. Let me learn about her symbology. Let me learn her mantra. Let me bring her into my life as a friend or a mother, right? Like, let me, let me, let me understand her. Let me get to know her. Um, so it becomes a little easier in that relatedness area. You know, then there's also fierce gods and goddesses who like, when you really need protection, when you really need um, to feel like, you know, they're destroying all the negativity within you and in your life, then you go to them. So Hinduism has a wide spectrum of gods and goddesses. And I like to think of it as a way to connect to God, ultimate God's different aspects, and then have that um, be useful in your life. And also, you know, I love the relatedness of it too. All right. So, um, if you could talk a bit more about cities, um, the supernatural manifestations um, that can be obtained through certain levels of consciousness and meditation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're called city powers. And Patanjali Yoga, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras is a great um, book as well as course that Dr. Pillai does because what it does is it gives this kind of four-step process of being able to quiet your mind in such a way that you can get to the place where you can focus on something that you want to either become or have. And if you want to have the ability to read somebody's mind, if you want to have the ability to um, you know, transport your energy body to somewhere else, you can use these, this technique in order to focus so deeply on it that that becomes something that is possible for you. Um, so there are Siddha masters in India and probably around the world who have done this and this in other lifetimes to have the ability to like manifest the booty, you know, for example, the sacred ash in their hand or man, I haven't been around them, but some of my friends have been around the Siddhas that have been met in India who can just, you know, pull something out of their beard, right? Like, or like, or literally just manifest like a little statue. So it's, it's, it's making matter out of energy, right? Like they can, they can transmute energy into matter, I should say. And because they've just studied it. And, it, and my first teacher, uh, Dr. Frederick Lenz, Lenz would say there's a difference, right? And Dr. Fly agrees. There's a difference between city powers and enlightenment. You can have city powers because you worked on it. That doesn't mean you're enlightened. Enlightened is getting through stages of awareness and consciousness that you're beyond all of this, right? That you don't, you don't need your karma, your ego, your maya, which is you know kind of the three impurities in Hinduism. Um, so you can have you can be a you know proficient city master, but not have enlightenment or the ability to really, um, you know, carry that wisdom. Uh, to that that could be useful <laughs> could be useful in the world as well so did that answer your question yes 
Um, and you kind of started talking on my next question, which was, uh, could you describe enlightenment a bit more? Um, are there different stages that we could call enlightenment? Are there different types of enlightenment? Because I know um, just from my own studies, uh, like the word Buddha means enlightened one. Um, but I also understand that not every enlightened being is on the same level as Buddha. So um, what could you say to that topic? Yeah, so I don't have personal experience in it because I'm not enlightened. But um, from what I know and what I've learned is the yes, that there are levels of enlightenment. In fact, my first teacher would say that he's like, I'm first level enlightenment. You know, like I have more ways to go. But he but when I was in the room with him, the room would turn gold. Right. Like and you just could feel the energy. You knew that there was a different consciousness going on, different than anyone else that I had ever met at that time. And I was young and I was in my 20s and it was just incredible. Um, and then when I met Dr. Pai, I was like, oh, because when you meet an enlightened being, typically you, you can you can feel you can feel and sense their energy. And if you're um, kind of open to it, you, you'll know. Right. And so when I met Dr. Pai, I was like, OK, yeah, this is this is total next level stuff. <laughs> you know, he um, uh, I don't know what level of enlightenment he is or anything like that, but it's uh, it's intense. And anyone who's been in, you know, with him in the room with him or in a seminar with him or, in a, you know, India trip with him, they, you know, things happen. <laughs> he precisely is able to change people's energy, change their karma, remove obstacles from their lives, create blessings. And one of the ways, you know, someone is enlightened is that they can, one, one is that they give off energy, right? Um, that they can transmit that energy to someone else. So they're, they have it. They're giving it off. You sense it, but then they can also send it to you. So if I wanted you to have like a third eye experience and if I was enlightened, I would be able to do that, right? Like I would be able to give you that experience. Um, what else? It, there's different, uh, there's also relating back to the chakras. When you have mastery over this energy in your body, and you're able to open all your chakras into the third, I'm sorry, third eye and into the crown chakra. And then above the crown, there's actually like a 12 inches above your um, head is another chakra. And then that one, when that said to open up fully, it's called a lotus. And the lotus fully opens up. And that is when the enlightenment energy is fully activated. So there is, you know, a process that is related to how you feel the energy move through your body, how open and awakened your chakras are and, and to what level they get to. Okay. So um, one, of, one of the first things I saw Dr. Palai talk about, this might be like one of his most famous things, is his light body. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Also, is, that, is the light body the same as like the energy body? Is that the same of the, as the uh, Merkaba? Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's all the same. And I know I light up when I hear it because I, I know how much he loves it. And, you know, he'll just walk around and chant these, you know, beautiful mantras that are all about light. Arupurum Jyoti, Arupurum Jyoti, Tanipurum Karne, Arupurum Jyoti. Like that's the grace light, the light of a rule, the light of God, the light of compassion, the light of love. Let it envelop all things. Like he, he feels strongly that the ultimate form of enlightenment, going back to your, your last topic, is the light body. And the light body is, yes, we all have a light body, we have an energy body, but to dematerialize your physical body so that you are only light is the ultimate form of enlightenment. It's the ultimate level of enlightenment. And he was, uh, and he, you might have heard him talk about how he was Swami Ramalingam in a past life, where Swami Ramalingam, and anyone can go look this up, Balalar, dematerialized his body. He literally turned his body into light. It was, you know, it's documented um, even by the British who occupied India at the time. Um, and that was Dr. Pillai's prior lifetime. So he's, and in that life, he said, you know, look, most of you don't want any of this. And, and we didn't, the folks who were around him at the time, um, I might have been one of them. Uh, we're like, uh, you know, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm not so sure. I'm not a burst of the light, or I want to decompose, you know, dematerialize my body. So he said, I will give you parts of me. I will give you my light, and you'll come back. And when you come back, you'll have an opportunity to try it again, right? It's a multiple lifetime lessons. Um, so in this lifetime, Dr. Ply is still very committed to 
uh, the light body, helping more people want it and be on that path. And so whether you're dematerializing your light, your physical body in this life, at least you are kind of on the path to knowing that that's the ultimate. And um, so there's mantras that he's given, there's teachings, there's many different courses that he's um, given on the light body. So again, it's, you have a light body already. We have this undying soul and, and light aspect of us. And then we have this physical body. And in order to fully achieve your light body, you would be able to dematerialize your physical body and only be light. And some would say that Jesus did that when he rose from the dead. He took his body, right? It wasn't that he, you know, the body was there and then the body was gone and all of a sudden people saw his light body. So that ascension aspect of um, uh, of both Jesus and Swami Ramalingam across different, you know, religions, I find very interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Um so um, something I've also heard him talk a lot about is uh, initiation and transmission. Mm. What, are the, what are the different forms of uh, initiation or transmission of energy? Yeah, great question. Um, so there's different forms and they're called different things. And it's uh, one is uh, you can touch someone through initiation. I think it's called Sparsa. I don't know all the I don't know all the Sanskrit names, but one is Sparsa, and that's a touch initiation. There's um, I think it's Diksha, uh, where you are uh, receiving an initiation from the eyes. Um, there's uh, a vocal initiation. You're going to hear the voice of the master and receive initiation that way. So those are the and there, I know there's other. There's other um, forms. Those are the ones that I'm most familiar with because that's what Dr. Bly typically does. Like he's done touch initiation. He's done, you know, looking at him um, as well as his voice and his projection of the initiation. So initiation is basically a way for the master to bring a new level of energy to the student. And so if I want to be initiated into a mantra, and I'm chanting this mantra and it's going fine, right? Like I'm saying it over and over and over. But now the master who holds the ability to transmit a new level of energy, understanding, empowerment around that mantra initiates me into it. I receive this um, kind of energy input, right? Like this uh, uh, zap of energy. Like I'm, 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 I'm now holding this this, I don't know how else to explain it, the energy from that initiation that now I can use. The initiation never goes away. Once you receive it, it's yours. You know, you want to keep it alive through, by doing whatever it was you were initiated into. So if I was initiated into a particular mantra, I can keep doing that mantra. And that mantra is more effective, let's say, than a, than a mantra that I wasn't initiated into. So initiation brings you to the next level of your growth, your experience of whatever it is you're initiated into. Awesome. So what was your, um, well, it's kind of two questions, but how many initiations have you received and what was your experience in initiation? Wow. I have more than I can count because Dr. Bly, you know, he does so many different programs and I've been with him for 23 years now, everything, you know, um, and he's very generous with his initiations in terms of like courses that he does where he initiates people into mantras and to um, techniques, uh, different things. So um, I, I feel so grateful that I was initiated into being able to teach um, his teachings. I was initiated into be able to initiate people into the Shreem Burzi mantra, which I hold very dear to my heart. Like, so that was a big one for me um, that he initiated me to be able to be initiate and initiate like to to initiate others so which means um i'm just carrying the lineage right like i'm carrying the energy from his lineage so you know he got the, that mantra he created that mantra and then he's holding the power of that mantra he passed it on to me now i can pass that on to others through a particular initiation all right so um 
some t uh, it's a little bit on topic a little bit off but what is um satsang yeah satsang is um getting together basically it's it's a com it's community and it's conversation around a spiritual topic so like kind of like what we're doing right but if we had more people then there would be more conversation around like oh you know let's talk like or if you pulled like even if you pulled like one topic you know uh, uh, a verse from the Bible, and you discussed it. That's that song. You're discussing a spiritual topic. You are, you, and then you're helping each other elaborate on it, understand it better, incorporate it into your life. Like that's important. That's an important aspect of spiritual teachings. Not that you're just learning it and then just going and doing it yourself. To bring others into the fold, to understand it better, to like to really implement. You know, we can learn stuff, but if we're not sure implementing it. <laughs> What's the point, right? You're, then you're just a, a walking encyclopedia. You need to make sure that you're um, putting into practice that which you're learning. And satsang really helps, I think, do that. Awesome. So um, going back to a bit of a previous topic, um, mm -hmm. what are some of the different ways that someone can achieve enlightenment? Uh, <laughs> you're asking the tough questions now. Um, ways to achieve enlightenment, I think... Um, persistent practice, like finding a teacher. So my first teacher, he said, you know, maybe back in the day um, when the world wasn't so energetically, uh, well, <laughs> energetically congested, right? When there was more clarity, there wasn't, like we have, so, we have so many people on the planet and everybody's pretty much constantly thinking negative thoughts, right? Like if 80% of our thoughts are like, and we're having, you know, 30 to 60 thoughts per minute. And most of them aren't like, how can I help you? Most of them aren't like, what a great life I'm creating. Like we default as humans, just our mind, we're defaulting to what's wrong. What do I need to fix? Worrying about stuff. Like, and now you have 8 billion people doing that and we're all psychically connected, right? Like whether you know it or not, right? Like, and you kind of know this when you go into like a room with a bunch of angry people, like you feel it, you're like, oh, okay. Let me back out. If you go into a room with a bunch of like peaceful people, you feel it. Energetically, psychically, we are all feeling one another. <laughs> and so now that we have more people on the planet than ever before, we are influenced by energy, that by all the energy. And it also helps, like if you go to the mountains, you know, you feel a little better. If you're in like downtown LA, maybe not so much. Um, so when there were less people and when you're in less people, uh, locations with less people, you have more psychic freedom. You have more ability to kind of feel your own self. Um, and so when that was the case hundreds of years ago, it was easier to become enlightened on your own or, for, or so I'm told, right? Cause there's not as much, um, of this congestion. Now that we're in this modern world, it's very important to have a teacher. It's very important to have, if you're really looking to be enlightened, if you're really looking to open up all your chakras, if you're really looking to, looking to make a, you know, that big difference, then you would want to have a teacher, someone who is already enlightened um, to help guide you and also to plug in, right? Like, so as we talked about initiation, having a spiritual teacher to me is like, we are our own like light, right? Like we are our own light bulb. But when you plug your socket into someone else who's got like a bigger electrical circuit, all of a sudden you have more light. And to me, that's what it is to like really study um, with an enlightened master. All right. So meditation, so, consistency, um, opening your chakras and studying with a master. <laughs> okay. So um, in describing Dr. Palai's backstory, you mentioned that divine beings would um, appear to him. What are some of the, the different divine beings that are familiar in your culture? Um all the gods and goddesses that we talked about, right, from Hinduism, any one of those. Uh, Lord Shiva, for example, he has a very close connection to. And that was the temple that he would go to as a child. Um, Patanjali. Yoga. Patanjali is known as the father of yoga. And the Patanjali Yoga Sutras is the book that I mentioned. Um, there's a shrine in this temple in Rameshwaram, which Dr. Fly would go and sit. So that was another one of the divine beings. He was a siddha, right? Like he's a master. He, um and these Siddha masters we mentioned, we talked about before, um, like Babaji is another one of those. It's, um, there's lots of people called Babaji because Baba means father and Ji just is like a, 
uh, a way to say it with respect, right? So, but there's the avatar Babaji who went into the cave and still lives there, right? Like for thousands of years. So there's these beings who may not be considered God, they're, they're not considered gods and goddesses, but they're siddhas and saints and um, they live in other realms and we can access them, right? Or, and if you're open enough and they want to come to you, they can come to you. So yeah, the divine beings are the gods and goddesses as well as the siddhas and saints um, who also can, can come. And they help us out, right? Okay. Like, full moons are the, one of the perfect ways to um, access their energy a little bit more because they they energetically become more present on the earth plane on full moon days and nights. Why do you think that is? Like uh, full moons specifically? Um, it it has to do with the the moon holds a lot of um, energy and there's different moon phases from the new moon to the full moon. And the new moon is more of the time where the mind, less mind, it's, it's more, it's a great time to meditate. And then as we go through like a waxing phase where we're growing into this more abundant full moon, then we have more energies available to us. So the new moon we think of is more of like a collapsed energy where we can go inward. Um, and then the full moon is where there's this abundant energy. And, uh, I think it's I think it's the you know the divine beings the gods goddesses are more activated or certain ones certain of them are activated during this full moon, and then we access that energy. And so um, yeah, different moon phases have different types of energies that are conducive to different actions and activities. And the full moon is great for um, abundance for accessing the divine beings, prayers, uh, rituals, things of that nature are all multiplied during the full moon. So. Um, continuing on that topic, who are some mystics throughout history that somewhat inspire you? <laughs> mystics. Um, the, I have to say, like, one of my favorite ever is Vishwamitra. And he was and is um, a saint, right? Like, he started out as a king. And he was a king to, you know, his kingdom. And he saw people suffering. Didn't have money, you know, lack of you know, poverty, lack of food and things. And he thought, well, I can give away my money, but that wouldn't even be enough to feed all my people, right? Like, so I need a divine solution. And so he, um, he found out that this other sage, uh, Vishista, had this wish-fulfilling cow. And he was like, well, I need that cow. I need to be able to feed my people. I want, I, he's, ultimately, he was compassionate. And then he's like, well, I'm going to go with my big army and I'm going to by force go and take this cow because the cow's going to be able to give me everything I need. And Vashista is, Vashista is another one of these lightened beings um, who was like, you're so, so, you're so silly. There's no way that you can fight off my, you know, my spiritual power with your might. And um, anyway, long story short, <laughs> through these actions, he realized there's nothing you can do at the human level, working hard, uh, getting a big army that could overpower the spiritual energy of anything really, right? So, so then he dedicated his life to becoming enlightened and he spent all his current lifetime and then was able to go in, like I said, they kind of, these siddhas, once they achieve a certain level, they can go into other dimensions. So then he went into another dimension for thousands of years and meditated there. In fact, he was the one who gave Dr. Pillai the Brzee mantra, B-R-Z-E-E, -E, and that Dr. Pillai received in a Nadi scripture back in like 1998. And since then, then Dr. Pillai took Brzee and put Shreem in front of it and created Shreem Brzee. And Shreem Brzee has kind of as a mantra has taken on a life of its own. If you do a Google search on Tree Brzee, you'll see lots of videos and websites and things aren't even from us. Meanwhile, it was originated from Dr. Pillai um, and this great saint, Vishwamitra. I love him because uh, he also gave the world the Gayatri mantra, the Om Bhur Bhuvaswaha, that mantra. Um, so he's given the world um, you know, two incredible mantras. In fact, Vishwamitra means friend of the world because he's so compassionate. And I had a amazing opportunity to go to his temple in India. And it was one of the, like, one of the most profound experiences of my life. Like I just, it's tiny little 
very humble temple. You go in there and it was just, I was so overwhelmed with his compassion, his love, his energy that like, I just started weeping. I was like, oh my God, it was just like, there was just so much energy in there. So anyway, he's my favorite. <laughs> and um, uh, for that reason, there's others too, like Mother Mary, like, um, you know, the, the, just the ultimate amount of compassion and love that she has for humanity, for, you know, bringing Jesus into the world. And if you've ever been in, um, it's the St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, they have this kind of walled off, like, place for Mother Mary, you, you enter that, it's like a shrine. I mean, it's just so entered. It's just a vortex of her love. It's, it's incredible. Awesome. So um, what would you say is the difference between a sage, a saint, and a siddha? The siddha is the, is, um, well, you know, that's a really good question. I'm not sure entirely what the nuances are, is between them. Um, you know, sage is someone that I understand is like on the path, right? Like they are, they are, um, they've gone beyond your average human and are able to, you know, kind of process and create, create more abundance, more things in their life. A saint, I, from what I understand, kind of attains a certain level of achievement and mastery. And so does a siddha. So I'm not really sure what the difference is between that, I guess, a siddha and a saint. Okay. So what is the understanding of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in your culture? Mm. So... I come from, I, I, I always feel like I'm of two worlds, right? Like, so I've, I've, the Christian world is, oh, is like, is always my heart, you know, it's where I, it's where I came from. Um, and then as I grew and learned more about Buddhism and learned more about Hinduism, I realized there's so many similarities and that it's just different paths. So in, in Catholicism and or Christianity, you know, you don't believe in multiple lifetimes you believe you die and then you go into heaven, go into the king, the kingdom, right? And that is where the saints are. That is where Jesus is. That is where God is, right? That's, that's the ultimate attainment, the kingdom. Uh, and then, uh, and then in, in, I won't get into Buddhism, but basically Buddhism is, is there. It is that, uh, well, I won't get into Buddhism because I don't know it as well, but uh, in Hinduism, um, there's multiple lifetimes and there's God, there's the kingdom, right? There's heavens and there's different, and there's different heavens. So like, you know, there's heavens for, you know, this particular world has a heaven, this particular world has a heaven, but ultimately there's heavenly realms. And, um, and the same thing, you want to attain your ability to go there. But in Hinduism, there's more levels, there's more steps to getting there. So like you have multiple lifetimes, if you didn't achieve what you wanted to, and you have a desire to fulfill that, you come back to fulfill it. Uh, if you did something where you kind of need a lesson to be learned, you come back to learn that lesson. If you did something and you, you know, have something bad that you did that you didn't, you know, resolve, you have to come back and resolve that. So this is more of a process to getting to, um, that level of attainment in, in a sense um, where you are able to then kind of finish off in, in uh, the kingdom. I don't know where Nelson went. I don't know if I'm the only one here. So it looks like we are having some issues. You're back. <laughs> yeah. I was going to start hosting the show for you. I was <laughs> All right. Um, so my next question was going to be, what are some of the, uh, what are some of your Dr. Polly stories of some supernatural things that you've witnessed in being around him for so long? Hmm. Um, supernatural things it happens more often when 
we do group events. So we used to do in-person group events a few times a year, including India trips, trips to India where Dr. Ply would come. Um, and in during those gatherings, what I noticed more specifically is that he really turns up his energy of kind of creating an energetic bubble around everyone there. And it's as, it's, it's, just, it's like certain parts of life just get blocked out and you're able to be inside of this spiritual realm with him. And when you're in that spiritual realm with him, while the other parts of your life are being blocked out, you can accelerate and learn things faster and have new experiences and have transformations or like awakenings that occur that would not have happened if you were just at home by yourself doing your thing, you know, kind of continually being bombarded with life. And it, it may be subtle, um, in some senses, it may be dramatic in others, you know, depending on the person and what they're ready for and what they're open for, what they want. Um, but my experience is, and every time, in fact, when I, before I even knew Dr. Ply very well, and I wasn't working for him or anything, I just, every time he offered an India trip, I was like, I'm going, because I know I will not come back the same person. Every single time it was like clockwork. You go there, you're inside this, like this energy, uh, vortex, um, both for him created, but also the energy vortexes that you go look for the locations, the temples, the, you know, everywhere you go, there's just like a certain amount of energy. In fact, my first India trip, I didn't even go with him and still had like a massive transformation because he was just focusing on it. We talked about the power of enlightened being. That was one of them. That's like his ability to transmit his energy to people that he's not even with. So he knew we were all on this trip. He knew we all needed you know, some, some major transformation, uh, karma clearing, and he empowered us as we left because um, he knew who, who was on that trip. So that's his superpower. He would, he would say that his city power of this lifetime is to change people's destiny. And I've seen him do it so much. Like if he, two ways, one, someone can go to him inwardly and say like, yeah, I really want to change, right? And, I, and they start doing his teachings. If they're sincere and they are committed, it'll happen, right? Like that transformation will happen. Their, their destiny will shift. Uh, the other one is if he knows you personally, right? Like if, he's, if you're blessed enough to have him focus on you and know what your problems are, he can target his energy to help you um, change that destiny. Anything that's gone, you know, wrong. Um, he's done it with me with different relationships that I've had. He's done it with me with my career. He's done it with me with, um, you know, I was supposed to get into a bad accident. It was diverted. Like there's magical things, you know, there's, uh, that, that happen inside of his worlds and his, his realm. All right. So, um, we're getting ready to wrap up. What are some uh, books that you would recommend for people who wanted to learn more about your culture? <laughs> um, I would instead refer people to Dr. Pillai's YouTube channel <laughs> um, in terms of, because he's not typical. If, if you're talking about like a culture of Hinduism, he's not your typical Hindu teacher. He is taking from the Egyptian archetypes, Hinduism, Christianity, um, quantum, quantum, um, uh, physics, right? Like he pulls all science, like he pulls all of this together, which to me is what it is. It's not just one culture. It's his amalgamation of, you know, what he's learning, what he's integrating, what he's then teaching the best of. So there's like a thousand videos on his Pillai Center YouTube channel. Go watch, you know, some of them. There's some playlist. There's also another channel that we have called Human Evolution TV, which is his older channel. Um, so you'll see him with a long beard or you'll see him looking certain ways um, or just talking more slowly. Um, instant manifestation. Manifestation is one of his biggest, you know, topics in terms of practically applying spirituality, not just to go be spiritual, to sit in a room, um, to have experiences, but then to take that and use it in your life. What do you want? Do you want a relationship? Do you want more money? Do you want a better career? How do you apply his teachings, his very specific mantras to your life in a way that you can now get what you want, fulfill your desires. And when your desires are fulfilled, then you can also spirit, you know, send some, spend some more um, time on, on meditation. So if you're able to pay all your bills, 
you're going to be able to uh, focus more on being at peace, you know, finding your center, things of that nature. So I love, in fact, one of the things he talks about is having a 200% life, 100% material, 100% spiritual. And to me, this is what makes him so different from other teachers. And he's very open about helping people wanting to make a, you know, have both be light body, 100% spiritual, making money, you know, 100% material and, and being comfortable. So we have the Stream Brzee is like I mentioned before, that's one of the one of our most popular mantras um, because it has um, both qualities to it. You can have beautiful, abundant, joyous experiences as well as ways to have a pathway to prosperity. Awesome. So um, you mentioned the two YouTube channels. Are there any other places where people can connect with yourself or with Dr. Pillai's uh, work? Yes. So Pillai Center on all the platforms. So we have, you know, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, Pinterest, also Stream Brzee Official has its own set of platforms. You can go check that out. Um, and then mine is Gina Greary. So you can find me also um, on different platforms. And uh, you'll see me a lot on the Stream Brzee channel because I happen to teach a lot on that topic. Um, and we host, you know, monthly workshops for free and, and, and um I'm one of the teachers there. Well, that's great. Um, before we close, do you have any closing thoughts, remarks, any encouraging words, a short blessing you would like to share? Yeah, like go for it. I feel like I feel like the spiritual um, kind of spiritual people tend to like sit back and wait. And one of Dr. Pillai's teachings is like doing you know doing both. You have to create what you want with your mind, with your vision, with, with in meditation, but then you have to get up and go do it, right? You have to create opportunities so that God is supporting you, right? You have to create opportunities for, for the divine to, to give you what it is that you were just manifesting and wanting to, to, to create. So um, use these techniques. Like if you want something new in this life, if you want something this year to be different than the last, you can't just keep doing what you were doing. You really have to commit to the creative process, commit to and understand that you are the creator of your life at every moment. And when you're not, and you're just letting things happen, then that's what we call karma. The karma is unfolding. Like your past is unfolding into your future. But when you are actively interrupting that karmic flow, right, and creating what you want to be new, and these are golden teachings. This is what is so beautiful and unique about Dr. Pillai. You have the mantras to block out negative thoughts in your mind. You have you know, rituals that can be done for you in India or that you're doing at your you know, spiritual technology. We didn't even get into that. You have um, you know, your manifestation techniques of thinking and feeling of what it is you want to create. And it's all the way to a path to a better life, right? Inward and outward, spiritual and material. And so um, I just encourage people to start, start the path. And see what unfolds for you. Awesome. Thank you for joining me here today. Um, it's been great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's been fun. Thanks, Nelson. Awesome. So that'll be all for this episode of The Inner. Thank you, Gina, once again. Um, My pleasure. More next time.